www.youtube.com slash Billy with a capital B, Younger uh, with a capital Y, Physics with a capital P, Solutions, plural, with a capital S at the beginning. And I am going to solve a little more rigorous uh, Gauss's Law problem. Specifically, this one actually has cylindrical symmetry. We've been, in fact, uh, most of the problems I've done, at least lately, were all spherical. I've done some in my lectures, of course, but the individual problems I've done by myself uh, without being in the middle of a lecture were mostly of a uh, spherical variety. So in this case, we're going to have actually concentric spheres, uh, which you might recall is what, what normal people would call coaxial cable. When I say normal people, I mean people other than, uh, and even them, physicists and, and scientists and stuff like that, people that actually uh, install things, for instance, they call this coaxial cable. So uh, let me first share the problem with you. So here's the problem, how it's written out. It says consider a very long, and that means L much, much, much greater than R sub I. And I put an I there because I'm going to have three different radii, R, A, R, B, and R, C. So I mean, way, way longer than any of those. So consider a very long, non-conducting, uniformly charged uh, rho I equals 11.1 uh, microcoulombs per cubic meter cylinder of radius RA. It has a cylindrical shell of equally long length whose inner and outer radii are RB and RC respectively. Assuming the outer shell has a constant density 2, rho outer equals the negative of rho inner, that's what the subscripts I and O meant for me, equals negative 111.1 microcoulombs per cubic meter. Compute the electric field for the cylindrical coordinate R when R is less than RA, when RA is less than R, but bigger than RB, or should be when RA is less than R, but R is less than RB, and uh, when RB is less than R, but RC is bigger than R, and then finally when uh, RC is even less than R. Again, we're using the cylindrical coordinate R because it just lends itself so nicely to this. What R is really is the square root of X squared plus Y squared. And uh, if you draw a line from any point X, Y, then you know R would be the square root of X squared plus Y squared. But then there'll be a unit vector that points from the Z axis at the exact same height as X and Y are. And uh, along that line is where R hat points, but away from the Z axis. Uh, in the end, I would like you to get numerical values of the answers for the special case RA equals three centimeters, RB equals four centimeters, and RC equals five centimeters. So that's the problem. I've got it all written out. Uh, I've already went ahead and drawn the original cylinder. I still need to draw my Gaussian surfaces, but other than that, we're good to go. So let me stop sharing that screen and start sharing my iPad screen. So now I'm going to share my iPad screen in principle. And there it is. You can see I've already taken the time to draw it. I've uh, sort of punted and just drew little arrows pointing to infinity to suggest that this thing goes on forever and ever. We're going to take a small slice of it of length L uh, and consider that in general. Uh, what we do know, of course, is the uh, charge density inside of the inner one, of course, is just Ri, and the one for the outer is Ro, and both of them have a magnitude, which I'll put in absolute value bars to make sure everybody knows what I mean. Actually, I don't even want to write that. That was ugly. Uh, the magnitude of Ri equals the magnitude of Ro, which equals 111.1 1, 1, 1. 1 microcoulombs per cubic meter. Again, I'll just keep everything in terms of RI and or rho I and rho zero or rho O, excuse me, until the very end. Now, <clears throat> what we have here 
is uh, a Gauss's law problem because of the symmetry. We can use Gauss's law. And Gauss's law says the closed integral of e dot dA is equal to Q in close over epsilon naught. And in this case, we're using Gauss's law in this sort of non-traditional way where, where we're trying to extract the electric field from the integrand of the left-hand side. So as I have been doing, I am going to uh, compute the left-hand side, compute the right-hand side, <sighs> set them equal to each other, and then solve for E. So let's get cracking. First off, I'm going to consider uh, R less than RA. Okay. So in order to do that, I'm going to consider a Gaussian surface. Uh, based on the symmetries here, the this electric field should only have X and Y components. There should be no K component because if you thought there was a K component due to a charge a little bit higher than the location you are, then I guarantee you, you can find an equal amount of charge the same distance lower than you to cancel out that uh, Z component. So in fact, everything's going to be in the XY plane uh, in terms of the actual direction vector of the electric field but of course it'll be above the xy plane because it'll be at whatever z value you're at so with that in mind that suggests i should probably use cylindrical a cylindrical gaussian surface because it will be perpendicular uh to the to the surface of the like if you're picturing a cylinder as a soup can it would be perpendicular to the label of the soup can uh the actual electric field will be, which happens to be the same thing as parallel to the dA vector for the soup label part, and also happens to mean the same thing as the electric field is a constant on the soup label part. And then on the lid and the bottom, the dA will point up and down respectively, and those will always be perpendicular to the electric field. So those parts of the integrals are always going to be zero. So let me draw my spherical Gaussian, or excuse me, my cylindrical Gaussian surface. I'm going to draw it right here as if it's a radius smaller than, as if it's a radius smaller than RA. And I'm going to say its length is in fact L, lowercase L. So I'll say this right here is L. Okay, so we have in some sense some idea of exactly how big this is. Obviously, up here I'd have a dA top that points that way. Down here I'd have a dA bottom that points that way. And then out here I'd have a dA which I'll call SL for soup label that points out this way. My hypothesis is that E is going to be equal to some E of the cylindrical coordinates R. In other words, it's only going to depend on how far away you are from the Z axis times R hat. And remember R hat is, is basically a unit vector that for any point x, y, z has a height z and is on the end of a line that runs from the origin, or excuse me, from the z axis to the x, y point and then points one unit past that. That's what the r hat vector is. So now we can start with our solution. Left hand side. Well, we know what's going to happen on the left-hand side. The closed integral of E dot dA is just going to be equal to uh, the integral of E of R, R hat, dotted with dA K hat for the top, plus the integral over the soup label E of R, r hat dot da r hat over the soup label portion plus the integral of e of r r hat dotted with negative da k hat 
And of course, you can see that this r hat dot k hat is going to force this to go to zero. Similarly, this r hat dot k hat is going to force that to go to zero. And in fact, all you're going to get, which is going to be the same, by the way, for each of the left hand sides, all you're going to get is, let me not write that in red. All you're going to get is e of r times 2 pi r l. And just to remind you, r is the radius of the Gaussian surface. And l, of course, is that length. So that's our left-hand side. And again, I just want to remind you, that's essentially going to be the left-hand side for all of the parts here. The right-hand side equals q enclosed over epsilon naught. So that's a bit of a problem uh, in that we're not taking the whole slice. But what we do know is that uh, rho i is a constant. So we know, for instance, that if I wanted to find out exactly how much charge, say, was uh, in my little lowercase radius r and my little lowercase l distance, then I can reach the conclusion that basically uh, by charge density is such that I would have uh, a charge given by pi r squared l times rho sub i is equal to q enclosed. Because obviously rho sub i is the charge per unit volume and the volume, of course, in that little sphere is pi little r squared times L. So now I can say left-hand side equals right-hand side. And I will get E of R, whoa, E of R times 2 pi R. Ooh, let me go down the line with this. I noticed there were some problems uh, when I put that real R right hand side up there. Actually, let me just go ahead and do this. Kill that, kill that, kill that out of there because that made it look ugly. Okay, so let's say right hand side is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. And let's say that we know Q enclosed is equal to pi r squared l times rho sub i, or excuse me, rho sub little lowercase i. So that's just something else we figured out, not part of that calculation there. So I'm just going to put pi r squared l rho sub i over epsilon naught. I'm going to set left-hand side equal to right-hand side, and that is going to give me uh, notice we'll have E, which I want to leave off the of R part, 2 pi R L is equal to pi R squared L rho I over epsilon naught. You can see the L is going to cancel out and the pi is going to cancel out. So what we have is E is equal to, oh yeah, by the way, one of the exponents on the R will cancel out. So all I'm left with is E is equal to rho sub I over two epsilon naught times R. And that points in the R hat direction and that's for R less than R A. So I've got that part. <laughs> Now, let's consider R, or let's consider better yet, let's consider R A less than R, less than R B. Again, left-hand side, as I explained to you before, even though now we have a uh, Gaussian surface that is in fact this big okay 
it still has, of course, a radius R, but this time the R is between them. But as I said before, the left-hand side is just going to be integral E dot DA is equal to zero plus zero plus E times two pi R L. Actually, let me not write it that way. That looks like, like I'm going to be stingy with paper, which I am, but anyways, uh, equals zero plus E times two pi R L plus zero. And then the left hand side, excuse me, the right hand side is this time the entirety of the length L is charge. So Q enclosed over epsilon naught is actually going to be uh, pi R A squared L times rho I over epsilon naught, setting them equal to each other, you get E times 2 pi R L is equal to pi R A squared L rho I over epsilon naught. You can again see that the L cancels out with the L, the pi cancels out with the pi. Uh, but that's pretty much it this time. So we end up getting, again, based on our original hypothesis, we get that the electric field is going to have a magnitude of, in this case, we'll have rho sub i times r a squared over two epsilon naught with an r in the bottom, which means it's gonna fall off like one over r like we normally find out for infinitely long charges. And this is for R A is less than R is less than R B. If you're paying attention, you can probably see that substituting the uh, bordering radius for the little r gives you that these are actually continuous. For instance, if I place little r in that first equation with R sub A and did the same thing with that second equation, you'd see you get the same result. So ultimately, we will be able to just say this, this, and this. All right, now we're going to try the next part, which is where we're going to have RB is less than R is less than RC. Again, we're going to have a left-hand side that this time our Gaussian surface is going to be here of radius r. Like such. Again, this radius r is the radius out to the Gaussian surface. Okay, so that's r again. And therefore, I don't enclose all of the charge. I just enclose uh, the part of it that's inside of my Gaussian surface. So the left-hand side, which only depends on the flux through the surface, is going to be the closed is going to be the closed integral of E dot dA, which again is just going to be zero plus E times two pi R L plus zero again. The right hand side is going to be Q enclosed over epsilon naught, which for this case is going to be all the charge we had before, which was rho I times, remember when we finished with that, we actually had times RA squared over uh, actually, excuse me. I'm going to have to write this on a different line. It's not going to 
fit otherwise. So let me kill this. So for this one, uh, we're gonna say the right hand side is gonna be Q and close over epsilon naught, but Q and close is gonna have to be basically rho I times the volume of the entire uh, inner cylinder since we've completely went outside of that. And that of course is pi r a squared l and then plus rho outer but in this case we're actually doing a pi r squared l minus pi r b squared so i'm going to say rho i or rho zero times l and actually i'll go ahead and add the pi as well so rho zero pi l times r squared minus r b squared and all of that will be over epsilon naught so we basically got uh the two sides now i'm going to switch to the next page so i can make it uh fit we're going to say again left hand side equals right hand side of Gauss's law. The left hand side was E of R times two pi R L. The right hand side turned out to be quite odd. It was pi times L times rho O for outside of R squared minus R B squared. And all of that would be of course over epsilon naught. So we can see again that the pi's cancel out, that the l's cancel out, and that's pretty much. Ooh, I left off a whole term on this uh, other side. Plus, sorry, pi l rho i r a squared. So actually, that pi and that pi also cancel out. Sorry about that. I almost forgot it. So now I can say by my original hypothesis, which suggested, of course, that the uh, electric field only had a R component. So we say E, the electric field, is in fact equal to, uh, in this case, I'm going to say rho I times R A squared plus rho o times r squared minus r b squared all of that divided by two epsilon zero and then r in the bottom meaning it has a one over r dependence uh and of course there's also r there so it makes it not exactly a one over r dependence and again this is for r b less than r less than rc again as i told you if you look at the boundary conditions where r equals in this case uh r v you'll see that it matches up and if you let r equal rc uh you'll see that it matches up as well so i'm going to go ahead and box this off this is the correct answer for uh within the outer cylindrical shell so we got one last thing to do, and that is for R greater than RC. And again, I'm going to go left-hand side, which is the closed integral of E dot dA. Now, in this case, the Gaussian surface actually has to be way out here. beyond, of course, RC. And that's roughly it. And again, the radius of that is R. Okay, so now we have all the Gaussian surfaces drawn. I don't know why that one didn't stretch as far as I'd like it to, but there we go, close enough. 
Okay, so now I have all of those drawn. Again, with this, the top and bottom are going to give you zero. So, so I'm going to get zero for the k hat dot r hat plus e of r times 2 pi r l, because that's the surface area of the soup label. Again, imagine a soup can. If you sliced vertically down the side of the can and then pulled off the label, its length would be 2 pi r, i.e. the circumference around the can. Its height would be l, the height of the can. Plus the other one, which was the r hat dot negative k hat. Of course, that gives you zero as well. So that's why the left-hand side is yet again e of r times 2 pi, r, 2 pi r l. The right-hand side is sort of a little easier here in that we now have a total amount of charge from both the inner and the outer uh, cylinders, the inner cylinder and the outer cylinder shell. So q enclosed over epsilon naught is now going to become rho inner times pi r a squared l plus rho outer times pi l this time times r c squared minus r b squared like that and then all of that will be over epsilon zero and that gives me my whole charge notice how it takes into account the original charge on the inside plus the outer charge. Now with this in mind, I can just set left-hand side equal to the right-hand side and apply my hypothesis, which was that E is equal to some function of R times the R hat vector. So in this case, I'm gonna say E of R times two pi R L is equal to rho I pi L uh, R A squared plus rho zero pi L R C squared minus R B squared and all of that over epsilon zero. I can immediately see that my pi and my L cancel out with my pi and my L over here. And ultimately that's going to give me that the electric field E is going to equal rho i times r a squared plus rho o times r c squared minus r b squared all of that divided by two epsilon naught and the, uh, it now is officially falling off like one over r it doesn't have the extra little complication in the numerator the last one did and this, of course, is for R greater than RC. Now, this is particularly interesting when you investigate the numerical values that I suggested we do. We've now done, by the way, parts A, B, and we've done parts A, B, A was this part, B was this part, we've done C was this part, we've done D was this part. Now uh, we're just asked to do part E, which is uh, in the end, get the numerical values of the answers. So this is the neat part about this. Uh, first off, the numerical answers are uh, for part E, for part E, row I is equal to 111.1, .1 micro coulombs per cubic meter. Another interesting part was rho outside was equal to negative rho inside, and I'll just leave it at that, which you may already be seeing that. Also, we have RA is equal to uh, three centimeters, but in that, this case, I'm gonna call it 0 0.0300 meters. RB is 0 0.0400 meters, and RC was 0 0.0500 meters. 
So if we look at part D first, you will see something interesting. Uh, e, uh, for the given values of RA, RB, RC, and rho, we get that the electric field is actually equal to rho I times, check this out, this will be 0 0.0300 meters squared minus rho I. So if you remember, rho O is ne negative rho I times RC is 0 0.0500 meters. That will be squared. So I need to make this a square bracket. And then minus, I'll make this a round bracket, 0 0.0400 meters squared, close bracket like that. All of that would be over 2 epsilon naught r. But you can see that 5 squared over 100 is basically 25 over 10,000. And that four squared over 100 is 16 over 10,000. So 25 ten thousandths minus 16 ten thousandths gives you nine ten thousandths. And in fact, three over 100 gives you nine ten thousandths. So in fact, the electric field equals zero. for rho i equals negative rho o and r a equals 3.00 centimeters, r b equals 4.00 centimeters, and r c equals 5.00 centimeters. So that's one neat thing that we found regarding this. And so this is, let's say, uh, E part one. So we've got that, that's now done. Now the other parts are not necessarily much more complicated. I just got to go back and add the thing in. So for instance, we had rho i r over two epsilon naught. So for part A, we had E is equal to rho i r over two epsilon naught r hat. So this ends up becoming 111.1 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs per cubic meter. Let me check my math. I think that was right. R I, rho I, R over 2 epsilon naught. Yep, that works. Got it all right. Uh, and then times R, which is the distance you are away, and then R hat, of course, which is a vector, times 2 over 8.85 .8 times 10 to the negative 12th. Remember, that actually turns out to be uh, Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. At least that's one set of units you could use. So for this one, what we're going to get using my calculator is 111.1 e to the negative 6 divided by parentheses 2 times 8.85 e to the negative 12 in parentheses equals uh, 6.277 times 10 to the 10 to the sixth. Uh, that should be volts per meter times r times r hat.
So we do see a linear relationship. Remember that R hat just gives us a direction, but the R says that as you get farther and farther from the center, the electric field actually gets stronger. That's because the increasing electric uh, charge is growing faster than the distance away is growing, or at least in a way that I can overcompensate for it. Now, uh, for part B, which again is another part of E, we had we had E was rho I R A squared over two pi epsilon not R. Oops. Was rho I times R A squared over two epsilon not R R hat. That was what it was supposed to be. Again, I'll double check with that. Rho I R A squared two epsilon not R. It looks good. So this is going to be 111.1 .1 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs per cubic meter times, now in this case, R A, we know is 0, 0.0. 300 zero, zero meters squared. All of that will be divided by 2 times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. Uh, technically, that should be the, the units that I got before. Since I have an R there, I should have put a 2 there. I'm fixing it there now. Uh, but anyways, this will be in the bottom and then times an R and then times an R hat. So if I do my math, 111.1 one, one, one e to the negative 6 divided by parentheses, or excuse me, before I divide, I'm going to say times 0 0.03 squared. And then I'm going to say divided by 2 times 8.85 e to the negative 1, 2. So this time I get 5,000, this is E, is equal to 5,649, which I'll call 5.650, that's one extra sig fig, times 10 to the 3, and that should come out in volts. Uh, actually, it just should come out in volts over R. Reason being is because the R brings a unit of, me of a meter down at the bottom. So this will be volts per R, and the R comes out in meters. So you'll end up getting volts per meter just by putting the R value in there. So there's another one. Uh, I don't know why I circled the last one. And blue instead of red. I always try to do contrasting colors, but I did not that time. And here's me attempting to erase, which might not be a good idea. We'll see. Sometimes it's just best to let my, co my OCD go, but evidently this is not one of the times I'm willing to do that. So here we are. Okay, so now we've got part B. Uh, next, we're going to do part C, which part C was the part where we end up having rho R A squared plus rho and then the difference. So for part C, we have E is equal to rho initial R A squared plus a row inner, that is, plus row outer times R squared minus R B squared. All of that divided by two epsilon naught. And if I remember correctly, that should have been just a R down there. And that's exactly what I had. So just an R down there and then an R hat over here to give us a direction. So in this case, making it a vector, we're going to get uh, 
111.1 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs per cubic meter times, notice I'm factoring that out. I'm taking the, since row I and row O are the same, but only differ by a negative, I'm going to say this is RA, which of course is 0 0.0300 meters squared. And then instead of plus, I want to do minus to account for row I having a negative charge of row O. And then I'm going to say this will be R squared minus 0 0.0400 meters squared. And that'll end my closed brackets. All of this will be over 2 times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th. Again, Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. And then I'll have an R down there. And of course, I'll have an R hat, which running out of room, I'll just move it this way. I'll say equals, and I'll put the R hat right there, and that'll be just fine. Okay. So what I get for the front part is I'm going to take basically the 1.1, 1 .1, uh, 111.1 times 10 to the negative 6 and divide it by 2 times 8.85. So let's do 111.1 E negative 6. Uh, that should be uh, divided by, I thought it would be an L there, divided by 2 times 8.85 e to the negative 12 in parentheses equals, this is 6.277 times 10 to the 6th. And all this is going to be multiplied, of course, by meters squared and then divided by meters. That's essentially just multiplying by meters. So this is going to have a volts per meter squared unit right here. That's one way of looking at it. Actually, let me blow that up so I can make sure everybody can see that a little better than I did. That's volts per meter squared. Okay. And then all this is times uh, 0 0.03 squared, of course, is basically, I'll just say it's uh, 9.00 times 10 to the negative fourth meters squared minus R squared minus 0 0.04 squared in that case is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 3. Meters squared there as well. And all of this would be over R. And of course, it'd be a R hat times all of it. And it looks like I'm going to have to rewrite that R hat. Let's do this. I'm going to put the R hat right here. Whoa, don't do that. I'm going to put the R hat right here and then do 6.277 times 10 to the 6 volts per meter squared times R hat over R. So you can see that at least in between the inner shell and the outer edge of the shell, we're going to have a one, sort of like a one over R dependence, but it's going to be uh, mitigated a little bit by the R squared in the numerator. Uh, either way, we have now completed a pretty robust, tough, multi-part Gauss's Law problem, and I hope uh, that will be helpful to you. Uh, I know Gal. I know uh, G and Goli did a problem like this in their uh, fourth edition in chapter twenty-four, I think it is. Uh, but the funny thing is, the solutions all jacked up in there. So, or at least it was in that solutions manual. So, uh, hopefully, this will help you because this one's done.
differently. It's an entirely different problem, but it's like one that they did, but they uh, the solution manual, evidently the, prop, the person that read it misread it. So I hope that helps. And I hope you all tell a friend about www.youtube.com slash Billy Younger Physics Solutions. Thanks. Have a good one.